Hey, this is Paul Martin. And Ray the Roadie. For the Rock and Roll Chicago Podcast. How you doing today, Ray? I'm doing dandy. How you been, Paul? I've been doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. That's great. Uh, what do we got going on this week? Uh, this week, uh, we've got a lot of uh, cold weather is what we've got. Yeah, I noticed that. I noticed that. I'm, I'm not happy with this. I should be in Cancun. Oh, well, you, did you go out there for that podcast uh, no, convention? No, no. No, I checked. Uh, I checked with our finance department, and uh, you know, the moth said no. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, they did. They, they fluttered and said uh, it died right that's there. Right. That's they just it. Fluttered away. <laughs> and that, that's your indication yeah. that uh, they say no. That's okay. right. So yeah, no, 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 Cancun right now. Maybe, maybe some, maybe Florida later on this uh, this winter. Well, uh, I tell you, this week we we are going to talk to Greg Potter. Greg Potter, uh, great, great animated drummer, and uh, now plays with the Buddy Rich Band. Wow, yeah, oh yeah, uh, he's uh, he's been with them for quite some time now. Uh, him and Kathy Rich. Yes, Kathy Rich. Uh, 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 I, I don't know the relationship but we'll find out i guess i guess we will and uh and uh and, and as a matter of fact greg and i go way back um in the days uh but we'll talk about that i'm sure with him all right it sounds good let's get to it and talk to greg potter right now here he is hey this is paul martin and ray the roadie for the rock and roll chicago podcast sitting down with us today is the legendary greg potter how's it going greg that's the kind of uh, introduction I was hoping for. <laughs> when you use a word like that, yeah. Yeah, well, hey. I'm, I'm ready to go now. now Just in case you were like, "Oh God, we we ended up in a conference room somewhere <laughs> Some in a basement." We just exactly ran into, uh, in a stuffy suburb. Oh, I see. Yeah. Potter's there. Is he getting his hair done? It's a nice building, though. <laughs> how about it? Yeah. I told you guys I was a doctor, right? Because yeah, yeah, my yeah. practice yeah. is right yeah. down here. You can see how. I'm sorry, Doctor oh, Potter. Doctor Potter. Doctor Potter. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> legendary thing. Forget yeah. it. You, you, you've already you've already yeah. set the bar. The doctor's cool. Yeah. So, I, okay. so, so tell us, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started in in, uh, in music and uh, and I, I mean I know you, you're doing the Buddy Rich uh, thing with Kathy, yeah. uh, and, and which is uh, I'm sure is working out great for you. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> how could you? How could that be going wrong? Oh, isn't your life just beautiful? Tell us about the Jets <laughs> and the yeah. Um, let's talk about the real stuff first. <laughs> okay, because when you called me. Yes. Or you contacted me. Right. How do we say it nowadays? You yeah. say someone called. My God, you mean you didn't text him? Yeah. No, yeah, I, yeah. I actually talked on the phone with yeah. Paul. <laughs> now, have, I've, I've known this guy. Have I known your the partner? Have I known no. him like from the Ray? from the days? We've like, met before a long time. We've met. Uh, I mean, I'm not being rude. I'm just no. saying like because I'm going to say or I'm going to. Ex- I talked a little bit to Paul about this, but actually, Paul and the M and R Rush juggernaut. <laughs> Talking about it. Okay. They actually play a big part in the Greg Potter like yeah. like the story. Yeah. You know, I mean, okay. you said like, where'd you, how'd you get your start? Well, yeah. Coming I'm, to a theater uh, near you. Uh, coming to, right, right, yeah. which will be a film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as soon as we finish yeah. that Buddy Rich movie. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy Rich comes first. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. No. The man is done. All right, oh, I mean, yeah. but we'll get into that yeah. later. And we have what, four hours to, uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, four. let me make it quick. But I'm, let me, let me first give the props to them. M and R Rush, I mean, not, you know the story, or you, but early on, like I have, I have, I mean, not had, but older brother, and um, I was right out of high school, and uh, in a band right. called the Groove. Okay, because you said it's old Chicago stuff, so if we're talking sure, about yeah, old Chicago yeah, band, someone cool. might have seen us. That's right. In a band called the Groove, and I figured out. I think I, I had said. Because um, these are all this is a Chicago story, so when I drop Chicago names, you go. I we have yeah. talked to him already. Mark Dawson sure. was in a band called Dreamer, mm-hmm. right? And that was a big. When you're in high school and you hear about these clubs, and actually back in the day, right, early eighty, well, like, like yeah, early eight, 1980, right. 79, 80, whatever, clubs, nightclubs were actual. They were true breeding grounds. To you would see cheap trick. Oh sure, sticks. Right. Seminar Rush, Oreo Speedway. On a Tuesday night or something, too. I, I, yes. I, I, seven nights a week, you'd, you'd be able to go to... Right. But I'm saying, so as a young 
kid right out of high school, me, okay. you would hear stories, because I had an older brother who went to, and back then, I think you only had to be 19 or so, to, right. the it's Illinois drinking law. Right. Then you would go up to Wisconsin, it was only, I think you had to be 11, <laughs> 11 or 12 you could drink. Go down to Arkansas, you could be six. Yeah. Breathing. It, yeah, just bring, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. bring the infants in. Yeah, yeah. We, we got Van Halen and Kiss <laughs> are playing on a Wednesday. Whatever. So my brother would come home, you know, he's a couple of years old, and he'd come home on whatever nights and tell me about these bands. Yeah. I'm seeing these bands at a club. Yeah. You, as you got older, holy cow, it's just a bar with a stage, but it was a club and you saw the whatever, whatever. Yeah, the, the atmosphere is a, a lot of it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but it was it was a thing. Whereas you explain that to <clears throat> young people today, all they say is, well, do you have a video on YouTube? I've got <laughs> yeah. four million views. I, <laughs> I threw up in the bathroom of a Taco Bell. And uh, actually... Uh, I've gone viral. I mean, I had a virus at the Taco Bell, and I was throwing up, but my friend filmed it, and I actually got a four-picture deal with Paramount, and actually Potter wants to play me in the film. And, uh, uh, but this was back in the day when you did this thing called work to find, yeah. your, find your way. So my brother would tell me these stories about these clubs, and he would see bands, whatever. So Mark Dawson at that time is in a band called Dreamer. Dreamer. And M and R Rush, Dreamer. Right. You guys, are, you guys circuit. are playing. You're playing the circuit in these yeah. joints. So my brother had seen you we're guys. Three, and, four, but I'm saying nights a week. So. Right. I'm just saying Dawson now was our uh, with my through my brother and uh, the older guys because we were already in a band, you know, playing yeah. in the basement. But your next step, other than playing youth centers and and right. the Rex high Rex school gym, okay. you wanted to get into these clubs, but you had to be 19 or 20. I'm 16. I'm a Younger, younger version of what you see here. How many names am I supposed to drop in this story? Right, well, however many you as want. As many as you want. All right, all right guys. Because of all the clean living, yeah. Because there are really no drugs or anything involved in me for all the. I remember like there's no like oh I had a cloudy. I remember yeah, yeah. everybody. The guy's name was Dan Cavanaugh. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, sure. yeah, give it. So through Dan, so Mark Dawson says, you know, I got this young band. You know, it was yeah. my, my, more so my brother. I wasn't quite the. I overplayed and. Made your sure brother, I had a drum, was the bass player, Glenn Potter, Glenn, bass player, okay. Phil Dorner on um, keyboards and singing, and a kid named Danny Sabo. Okay. Remember Lee Popa? Does that oh, name sure, yeah. Okay, so it was Pope, Lee Popa was always around us too, but he didn't play, but he worked with Dreamer, and Danny oh, Sabo yeah. was one of his buddies, all from the, like the Lions, sure, sure. The Berwyn. Lee, Lee Popa mixed up in Irish for quite a while. Exactly. So I'm saying, we, all these people were all influential in getting Potter out of that high school gymnasium and into, right. uh, actually, no, that's this is where the magic happened. So, Dan Cavanaugh goes, yeah, I, you know, other than booking Dreamer, I book MNR Rush, and you guys were basically the Van Halen of yeah. like gigging, you know. I mean, say if, if Dreamer played ten gigs a week, I mean, I rushed it thirty-five gigs a week, yeah. and you guys were still getting more. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, you guys would play in the afternoon, then at night, yeah. Yeah. then go yeah. home and like <laughs> write more songs, and then well, yeah, we're doing four more gigs tomorrow, <laughs> yeah. whatever. So Kavanaugh's like, if you guys want to play, I'm gonna rush. Yeah, Dan Kavanaugh gets the groove. A young Potter. Imagine me at sixteen. I'm okay. pretty. Yeah. I mean, I'm, at, at whatever age I am now, I look like I'm... Um, How long were you playing drums at that point? Oh, at that point, I'm one of those guys that played the drums, like, ever since. Yeah, you were coming out of the womb? Yeah, I had, like, uncles, and, like, my uncle, <clears throat> you know, my mom's brother. I mean, like, you know, yeah. family members, because my family isn't, like, when we get to the... Kathy Rich portion of right. my story. When you hear her tell stories, it's like, oh, I could see how that happened. Yeah, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? But like for me, my dad's selling car parts. Uh, you know what I mean? And my, yeah. you know, Kathy comes from music, yeah, music or, you know, right, right. that background. When she talks about music, it's going to be a little bit different than me. But yeah. me, I was just, I, I was one of those guys, uncles, cousins, had drum sets in their basement. And what kid doesn't, you always put the kid behind the drums and you yeah. watch him. Yeah. Well, I happen to be one of those kids that sat down and they went, whoa, looks like this guy might have a little bit of, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, I had like... A little rhythm, huh? Yeah, like a rhythmic, and, and I took to it. Yeah. So then as, you know, so I'm, I would say, what, four, five, six, you know, I'm mean, a little yeah. guy, and then like, are we, you know, I would continue to play, continue to play. My parents saw it. I mean, I always think I had very supportive parents, yeah. you know, like supporting the arts and supporting. So, I mean, had drums. I didn't get my, you know, I had the drum set from Sears, which is where everyone starts. Oh, sure, you know, sure. See, for the young listeners, they don't even know what a Sears is. <laughs> no, no. Sears was like a tar- catalog, too. <laughs> 
actually got it from the catalog store oh, yeah. on Archer Avenue oh, by sure. Midway Airport. Right. They used to have the, out, the Sears outlet yeah. where you would go where sure. all the stuff that people had returned. I got the full Sears drum set that you would have seen in the catalog for 299 bucks. the whole drum set, $35. <laughs> nice, nice. They never delivered me a floor tom. Oh. They told me somewhere my parents got ripped off for 35 bucks. I think we made all right. Yeah. But they paid for a floor tom, a blue sparkle floor tom never showed up. So at some point when they do the movie and they're redoing it, if you see that there's a blue floor tom in the movie as me as a youngster, false. Yeah. I'm telling you right now. Fake news. Fake, fake news. news. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Make it, I was making drumming great again back then. <laughs> so I ended up with the red floor tom to go with the red hat. So, um, but yeah, so I had this... So and that would be out throughout my you know okay, young so, years. So Dan Kavanaugh. So Dan Kavanaugh. Ka- because remember, I'll yeah. spin this thing. Dude, this be, <laughs> <laughs> you kind of will hope or wish I did do drugs so he could settle me down. So you got Kavanaugh getting we'll put this a band. quarter in this guy. You put a quarter in this guy. <laughs> well, you yeah. realize I am in a hurry. Yeah. Kathy's probably got four pairs of shoes already ordered that I've got to oh. go pick up. For. <laughs> Um, so so <clears throat> through, through Kavanaugh, we start this band with me in it, my brother and the guys we just talked about, and Lee Popa doing sound for us and driving his. Did he have someone had a van? Whatever gets us out, and we get out with. We played a couple shows with Dreamer, Southside Clubs, and then we played Gordon Tech High School with yeah. the MNR Rush. Yeah. Now you guys didn't open up. What tune did you not? You didn't open up with Reach for the Stars, but I remember the second tune, You're the Only Woman. Yeah, yeah, we still do it. <laughs> so, like I was saying, yeah. but what did you guys open with? Well, we, we, we probably, we, we opened with quite a few different things, but we probably opened with a Queen tune. Now I'm here. No, yeah, no, 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 it was an original. Whatever, but okay. so then, You're the Only Woman, whatever, I, I remember that. But I'm at Gordon Tech High School with this band called The Groove, and Roman yeah. is working. Work, work for us. Work for I don't. Me. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if he was. Yeah, he was like he. At that point, he would have been. I think he would have still been. What was it? Cartoon teenage radiation or whatever. Yeah. Roman was there. Yeah. Playing with Steve Dahl approaches me at that gig, and said, you know. Yeah. Um. And, and at that point, I really didn't. And after you played, he, he I put uh, the groove played first. Yeah. I mean, our rush came on. I heard those yeah. songs really because we continued playing with you guys for yeah. a while, and then I um you know, throughout that. This would have been in March of 1980. So, I mean, we played with you and then... But the Steve Dahl thing happened through me being with them in our rush because I would not have... I don't know if I would have met Roman. Right. And he saw me at Gordon Tech High School, which is way on the north sure, side of sure. Chicago. So yeah. what are you Southsiders doing on the north side? Oh, we used to play, we used to play all you, you, Oh, you played... Like I said, you were the Van Halen of... <laughs> uh, I mean, you guys toured like... Yeah. Like you, or you played everywhere. But Roman saw me there and basically I think I was a Friday night and then I played... The next Friday at a Steve Dahl Breakfast Club at the Carnegie uh, Theater. So I mean, the gig happened. It was it wasn't a long drawn out process. I mean, Roman called me. Hey, we need a drummer. Yeah. They had some guy from. They had Jeff Brown. He was the drum teacher at that music store in Lansing, the Music Lab. Oh right. So I dropped names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I'm just saying. So, and then, um, God rest his soul. I believe Mike Powers was the bass player at that time. Right, right. Who then went on to work for Gibson or, no, Mike, or Mike Powers Guitars. Uh, right, right. Well, he well, he worked for PV and then he worked for Gibson. I know. Right, but I mean, so it was Mike Powers on bass, Don Melton on keyboards, Roman on guitar, and then I played. I mean, I was, you know, teenage yeah. radiation early on. I mean, right. they, like uh, the first one I recorded was another kid in the crawl. Casey would have still been the yeah. guy yeah. in the news, yeah. but so that would have gotten me from the high school to with Steve Dahl, and after th- Steve Dahl, forget about it. Right. That stuff uh, that right. exploded for me. I went right. from from Dahl. I mean, so where you, do we want to go? You from played with teenagers from 1980 through 86 till yeah. Dahl finally. Yeah. Um, he fa- he finally wrapped it up. I mean, I went direct. I went from high school to being on the radio and right. doing some pretty cool things. So to me, you know. All of us did. I mean, that was a pretty cool gig. and Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know how deep we want to get into that, uh, yeah. but I just wanted to get into that M&R Rush was... <laughs> we're there in the beginning. Like, if I had that gig now, I would... I'd have a different perspective, but, I mean, I was an actual... I was right... I mean, I got... I graduated from high school. I was double promoted, so I got out young. 
Yeah. And I had started, I started at Roosevelt University, Chicago Music College uh, oh, okay. at Roosevelt University downtown. So I'm right. already going to college studying music so to go I'm studying you know with the head percussion professor from the Chicago Symphony yeah. and I tell him I'm doing a, I'm playing with Steve Dahl at the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is like, yeah like, you know yeah. We're, we were playing wonderful yeah. gig I didn't say we we're getting paid I right. said we're getting we're playing these yeah. um, so going back now and talking to these percussion instructors in school and stuff how did you get that gig my time with that was the recording sessions we recorded at all the best studios right uh, CRC downtown on right. Michigan Avenue and I mean and then you're basically you would record the song what like on a Wednesday night and Dolls playing it on the radio yeah. Yeah. Thursday, yeah, Thursday morning I mean yeah stuff that nowadays you I don't know that that would ever happen or if it would happen who would hear you now because like we were joking about well I mean back, back in the day I mean AM radio was, was a big thing you know we, we recently interviewed the, uh, the Cry and Shames okay. and, and they said they recorded something and left the studio and heard it 20 minutes later playing the WLS I mean just that but it was the same idea yes. that you're talking about yeah. the next morning you heard it on the radio with but I'm saying that also back at that time when you were on the radio, it meant something. Oh, yeah. Nowadays, we have these things. You yeah. know, I'm also involved in the the rock and roll fantasy camps. Have you ever heard of oh, those? Sure, right. It's like where where people with extra money. You right. know, what I mean, like because I right. they're 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 quite expensive. Yeah. But they give you what you want. And that same same deal would say like VIP packages. Think about it. When we were younger. What you would have to have your girlfriend do to get you backstage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I meant that in a nice way because this might be a kid show. But I'm just saying nowadays, <laughs> if, if you can pay for it, you could meet Gene Simmons. Right. You could pay him enough. He'll come to your house right. and deliver some kind of vault filled with un, you know unreleased Kiss material. I think it's like fifty Kiss G's. condoms or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, think about it. So yes, you're right. The uh, uh, it's good to be rich or something. Yeah, yeah. Or it's good to be king or something. Yeah. But I'm just saying. When we were doing this stuff, or my time with teenage radiation, you know, early eighty, it, you didn't have all that. When when so when you recorded something and yeah, you heard yourself on the radio and basically what was Dahl's listening audience? And he was, yeah, you know, yeah. remember this would be before Howard Stern. This right. would he be was, before the guy. Right. Dahl was the guy. I mean, Dahl is. I mean, that's another thing that. You know, he in the loop at that time. He's at the that loop, was right? The wasn't AM? That was the top in the, in station. The country, right? Because yeah. you know, I do. I you do look well, like say when I talk to Kathy, who was not a Chicago person, Midwest person, okay. from LA, from New York. You talk about Steve Dahl to her. She, her reference point. Well, then again, she doesn't even know when I mention these great Chicago bands. How that's the greatness of a Chicago. But unfortunately, it's you are kind of nestled away in the center of the country. And yes, New York is hot. Yeah. LA is hot. Right. And we knew about the knack in New York. But did we know about Pez Band here in Chicago? No, no, no. You know, LA you know, or New York gave you Blondie. Did we know about yeah. Off Broadway? Yeah. It, it, I mean, it, although great bands, yeah. although yeah. great bands yeah. made records and stuff. But I'm just saying, it was just. But they uh, know disco demolition. There you go. <laughs> so they know disco demolition, and they they might even know the parody songs. Dahl did. Oh yeah, he well, had he had the medium too to put him out there. Yes, he did. He, how his perfect storm was his perfect storm. So I'm saying for me to be plucked out of a, yeah. a suburban high school and, and, <laughs> and sat down on a drum throne. Yeah, no. Yes, I had already won the Slingerland Louis Belson National Drum Contest. So right. I mean, I, I, I knew how to play that. the. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I didn't know how to play the drums yeah. and mm-hmm. you know, blah blah. But to go from just well, like I said, or I, or no, I haven't said it yet, but uh, when I did win that drum contest, I was like, yeah. it would be the year before Steve Dahl, and the, all the Slingerland Drum Company executives are there, and you know, I'm a. Where I'm was a that at? Um, I ended up winning the. I won first at Frank's Drum Shop downtown, okay, right, right. and then the regionals. I didn't win the whole event. The whole event, someone else won it. But um, that, uh, we see who the winner is. Can't win them all. <laughs> exactly. No, yeah, I said, yeah. I'll tell you that story is even funnier. Yeah. It went when I tell you about winning it. Whatever. So that's Frank's Drum Shop down in Wabash, right, right. where they had it. Slingerland Drum Company was right in Niles, Illinois. Right. But when I won in 
the, the, when I went to the regionals, which were held at, what's the college in Palatine? Uh, Harper College Harper, in Palatine. Uh, yeah. All the executives are there, the president of Slingerland, the you know, yeah. marketing people, and they're like, you know, kid, you've... Yeah, they, yeah. you got it. You're pretty, you got some stuff going on here. Yeah. When something happens for you, we're going to be here for you. Yeah. And you're a kid. Yeah, I know. Are we yeah. going to eat now? Or? Yeah. <laughs> I still get the sticks, right? Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Potter, you yeah. get the pair of sling on. And you could meet Louis Belson. Yeah. I'll tell you that. That is a pretty good story. Yeah. Yeah. But whatever, that would have been June of 79. The doll thing goes on in March of 80. Right. Okay. So I get a phone call from the head of, God rest his soul, Rick Piccolo was his name. He was the head of Big Steve Doll Fan. He goes, hey, are you the same Greg Potter, Steve Doll, yeah. you know, talking about on the radio? What do you want? And he, he was from Slinger. He was, he's, he was a, like a, was Steve a, a, a big a, a head of engineering marketing at Slingle and Drum Company in Niles. So, yeah, so now you've not only taken the kid out of the high school, but now basically the man's on the phone going, yeah, you're the right. same guy. Yeah. That, but, but, yeah, that's me, man. What, what, why? What, well, what do you want? What, 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 we got to make you something. Yeah. And that's how they came up with that, that Teenage Radiation drum set, the big black and yellow. Do you remember right. I had the big right. double bass? Because Dahl was like, well, seeing that you're only four feet tall, yeah. let's get you the, you know, get, you know, I was telling Dahl, yes, Lingo wants to make us something. Well, and I came up with the concept of, if you've ever seen the Godzilla movies, in the first Godzilla movie, they're pushing drums of radioactive material off the back of a boat. Oh, oh, the movie yeah. was in black and white, but from what it looked like, they were right, probably you had, you yellow. Had the symbol yeah, the radiation the symbol, yeah. and then they, they were yellow with a black stripe yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah. So that's the concept of where I came up with the black. And, yeah. and then, um, you know, the Slingerland guys. Here, I just thought those were the same Sears drums. No, no, no. Sears drums, <laughs> that story's another one. The Sears drums have been put away. They're in storage. You can you see them. them. Oh, God, yes. And, and you still have the, the teenage radiation drops? Everything. Yeah, good. That's yeah. like nowadays, see, now it, now that it's later, yeah. I think that's called hoarding. Well, no. And so now that we're going to get this reunion only together, they're going to they're gonna call. Oh, God. Only if, 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 only if they're piled in your kitchen or something, it's called hoarding. <laughs> well, I have a, I have <laughs> a storage space that, that I could be paying, I could be paying, uh, I yeah. could be paying a payment on a Bentley. Yeah. Instead, I'm, I'm keeping all, but yes, I have. Because yeah. you remember, I had the, um, the yellow and black teenage radiation kit. Then for the television, shows Slingerland made they were making the black drums with the gold hardware so black and yellow with the clock in the bass drum for the television show right, remember right, H2 yeah, early yeah, yeah. that Slingerland didn't do the clock in the bass drum that was done by I think Ken Heineman came up with that concept because oh, okay. they needed to shoot because it was a morning television right. show they needed to like they need to Keep you need time. to tell people what time <laughs> is because it's a, whatever but they put the the clock on the bass drum I still have the bass drum on the people clock people knew when to leave for work right? yeah. <laughs> yeah is that what it is <laughs> but yeah so um, yeah the Slingerland thing happened so yeah the, my time with those gigs and you're still sponsored by Slingerland no unfortunately Slingerland went the way of uh, Teenage right. Radiation Slingerland's no longer right. I'm now a Ludwig guy oh, okay. um uh, because Buddy Rich, well, Buddy Rich played Slingerland back yeah, back in the day. I Buddy played did. Slingerland through the yeah. 70s, but then he was a Ludwig guy, uh, 70, 77 through 85. He passed away in 87. Uh, okay. But um, so Ludwig makes me like replica drum sets of like what Buddy played. Right. Um, <laughs> that's as close as we're going to get to real. <laughs> well, right. Potter's drums look like him because yeah. you know, I mean, <laughs> it's not like I'm playing like Buddy or I look like Buddy or even smell like Buddy. Although I do try to spray cold, like the actual cologne the man wore. Oh, yeah. Ka- well, I mean, because Kathy's like a treasure trove of. I go to Kathy's mom's house. I'd go to the house in Palm Springs, and I'd put on Buddy's like robe, Buddy's clothes. <laughs> I'd walk about the, like Norman Bates, you know. But he would wear his mother's clothes. But Potter. <laughs> Go to the yeah. third person when yeah. I go into yeah. the nutty yeah. stuff. Yeah. But I'd put on Buddy's robe, and Kathy's mom would say, like, what is he doing? And I'd say, what what coffee mug did Buddy use? Because that's another thing. You go, like, to Buddy's, like, go to her mom's house. We'll take all the stalker stuff out. We'll edit that. Out. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, <laughs> well, the mom knows it. But, I mean, you go to their house, you don't even know that that's, like... Buddy Rich's house, like you, I was thinking, like you'd go into like, well, there'd be drums in that room, and yeah, yeah, yeah no. there's like one picture on the wall, of like, like Buddy yeah. and his, you know, like Buddy and 
would be Kathy's mom. Cool. Like one picture of him, Kathy said, well, that's at the forum in L.A. or somewhere, like when he was playing with Frank Sinatra. Right. So, but, I mean, no drums. It's like just a picture of Buddy in a you know, great yeah. tuxedo and Kathy's mom's all right from, from like 1981 or two or something. But no drums in the house. No. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if you go to... I don't know, you go to... Well, yeah, but... but wouldn't yeah, all that... Yeah, I mean, you go to my house, you don't find guitars lined up in... The, oh, you oh, don't? Like, no, if they're not no. like if, if, like, I don't know, your kids I came... Got a little, I got a little room in the basement that, you know, I keep all my stuff, yeah. Still, there's... I'm talking, you go to Buddy's, or, you know, the house that was in Palm Springs. Yeah. There was nothing. Yeah. And but Kathy will even say, first of all, when Buddy was alive, Kathy said, well, my dad came home. You didn't know he was Buddy Rich either. He yeah. didn't come home and, yeah. well, didn't he practice on the pet? No. Kathy had this look at him. Yeah. No. Yeah. He worked 300 and, 320 days. He was like yeah. the, he was the M&R Russian drummer. <laughs> this guy played, like, Kathy's, you'll see schedules, so, you know, we, stuff around the house yeah. that I see, like, m- the man's schedule, because back then, the schedule was written like that. Yeah. No computer printouts, you know what I mean? It was like the man, someone wrote these things, and you would see a schedule, buddy, one-nighters, on that bus or flying, just... Yeah, everywhere. A month of August, like eight, 1983, August of 83. Buddy did like, in the month of August, 27 dates. Wow. So, I mean, that means I'm playing, be it high school or be it, you know, because <clears throat> the guy would play like a command performance for the Queen at the London Palladium, get on an airplane, you know, land in New York, get on a bus and drive to Nebraska and play a high school. Right. I mean, Kathy said yeah. he just... The man works. Work, His work, work ethic work. is yeah. is something to be. But getting back to yeah. So I was wearing buddy's clothes, run, walking around the house, <laughs> and the mom says, "Would you please tell Greg to stop?" <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happened. But, so, so, but you now you're sponsored by Ludwig. By Ludwig, so I'm yeah. a Ludwig guy, and I have fake Buddy Rich drums. <laughs> and then there's also a company right here in Chicago called Trick. Trick Drum Company makes a Buddy Rich snare drum. Oh, really? So you can get. It's not a. It's a. It's a replica in that. Because something that you find, like when you, because people are into this vintage stuff, mm-hmm. right. vintage, vintage. Yeah. You know, I want stuff from. Well, you being a musician or yeah. you're, you're yeah, a musician, well, like a '64 Corvette right. doesn't drive like a 2019 no. no. Corvette. No. No. So same with these drums, guitars. You get an old something. It's a great piece to look at, and it probably costs more. Than the car you're driving right. to have this Les Paul or this drum right. set, for, but to take the thing out and play, yeah, yeah. Odds are it's not going to play and feel. So what we're doing with this trick, Buddy Rich Centennial snare drum, because uh, Buddy was a hundred years old, um, 2017. Okay. So uh, um, it's something you can play today. Oh, okay. Drives like a new car, but right, looks right, like right. a vintage right. piece of gear. So that, and same with the Ludwig drums. Technology is supposed to hit. like the Ludwig, yeah, the drums, because, right. you know, I've played on, you know, there were real Buddy Rich drums around the house, but first of all, you don't want to yeah. take those out and touch them. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying, but you, the drums are, a vintage drum doesn't feel like what they do. The, right. the drums today are, the Ludwig stuff is absolutely wonderful. And then this, this trick drum, I mean, I don't know how deep into my equipment, but yeah, I use... I just. Who, who's your symbol company? I'm a Sabian. Guy. Sabian, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yes, Buddy never played Sabian. He was always a Zildjian guy, but I've been with Sabian from. Remember, I had a career right. prior to this Buddy Rich thing. Right, so, right. Um, I am. Those people have been with me. Sabian has been with me, or I've been with them. You know what I mean? So it wasn't just, I've got to do everything that Buddy did. I mean, it's not that. I mean, we're. We are true to the. You want to be respectful of it. But I wasn't going to jump from a symbol company that's been with me right, for right. almost 15, 20 years I've been yeah. with Sabian. Uh, yeah. Now that I finally get a decent... So, so, I mean, they too. And Siljan and Sabian, I don't know how mu- music geek we want to get into it, right. but they are very closely related. Yeah, Actually, it is the same family. Oh, okay. The Z- Zildjian brothers split up and oh, I see. one took the family recipe here and one went there. Yeah, so I'm yeah, saying yeah. when you play a Sabian, they're not the same, right. but they're similar. Symbols are made in different weights yeah, inside. Yeah. So I'm saying they made me like yeah, yeah. what Buddy would have played. Yeah. Like I said, we try to be true to that because once I sit down and play, you go, oh my God, where's Buddy when you need him? <laughs> <laughs> well, no. this, this guy's got all the equipment. But now, let's, let's, yeah. Speaking of going back and, yeah. and being with Saving for a while, yeah. let's talk about uh, the, what you did play or who you did play with after Teenage and you were a band called Siren? Yes. So we, the, the Siren thing came out... Um, 
that would have been well there's more references or more um, drop more names <laughs> At the end of Teenage Radiation, you remember Johnny Skender, bass player? Sure. Played with, played with Teenage Radiation. Johnny Skender and I went to high school together. Yeah. Same birthday. Oh, really? Well, I'm a year younger than Skender. Okay. But okay. all August 19th. And then I can't, I don't know how much of the next I, but I'll be working with someone who also has my same birthday, but I can't really get into that. Okay. Now. But we'll figure it out and we'll add it as a... Uh. So amendment like, later, so but another another birthday similarity. But um, yeah, so Skender and I started playing with. You remember Tommy G, Tommy Gwenda from Pet oh, sure, Band, sure. And there were these yeah, Tommy so, have you, blind guy, blind guy. Talked about it, right? right. Yeah. There's Mimi, yeah. Mike Gorman, yeah. Tommy G, and Nick yeah. Rain on drums. Exactly. LA had the knack. We had Pez Band, right? So, um, and Kathy loved the knack. <laughs> she was in LA at that point. So her and Bruce yeah. Gary, and you know Bruce Gary, the drummer. Yeah. Um, she knew him, and, but, yeah. but we had that band. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, we did. So me, Skender, Tommy G, start jamming, yeah. playing. Tommy G goes, "Hey, I got these three sisters. They sing beautiful harmonies because they're sisters in the same yeah. family. Yeah. So I mean, the vocal cords are probably the same, but they did. Like the Lennon sisters. Like, <laughs> the Lennon, right. But these were the Massey sisters. Okay. So, Kristen, Claire, and Kath. Okay. Three sisters up from the you know, north side. Tommy G, we put a group together called VVS1. So this has been like late 80s. Okay. Um, we do this VVS VVS one like a diamond. Oh, okay. The one sister worked at a, a jewelry store downtown. So VVS oh, one best okay. scale of diamond, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, whatever. But where it happens is, so you got Tommy G on guitar, Skender playing bass, me playing drums, and these three girls singing. So we start playing. We go and do these. We go do a demo tape because Tommy G was brilliant when it came to recording right. back in the day. We actually set the drums up. Tommy G worked for DB Sound right. up in Arlington Heights. Yeah. Whatever, big warehouse. Yeah. So yeah. all those stories of yeah, Zeppelin got drum sounds in a in a castle somewhere. <laughs> yeah. We got our drums in the DB warehouse. Uh, I mean, but it was Tommy G's brilliance yeah. using live sound technology, but then recording it. You know what I mean? So right. we got whatever. It was that kind of thing. But we made this demo tape. I think it had probably eight songs on it. The three girls singing, us playing. What, was had, it all original stuff? All original stuff. That's what I mean. Tam, demo. Tammy wrote? Or? It was written by Tommy G, the girls. Yeah. I mean, I dare say I did. We did a demo tape, and no, I didn't get any writing credits, but I, yeah. I was there throughout it. The band splits. Two of the sisters and Tommy G go on to form a band called The Tammy Show. Oh, yeah, I remember them. Me, Skender... The one sister, Kristen, who's at this point working with Dr. Robert Haas. Do you remember the author of The Eat to Win Diet? Okay. All right. This guy is an amazing musician, along with being a, a he's not a, I mean, not a doctor, maybe a doctor, but a nutritionist. But he was famous for writing The Eat to Win Diet book. Then he went right. on to write the book okay. with Cher, Forever Fit, whatever. This demo tape has now got the Tammy show over here. Yeah. And a group called Siren over here. Uh, Me, Skender, the health author, and Kristen Massey get Siren, get a record deal on he Mercury. He was a guitar player. He was a guitar player. Yeah. Plays like, played like yeah. Van Halen. Or yeah. Ingbe. Yeah. Real intricate, beautiful. And again, like a, or not again, but he's a recording whiz. Yeah. Like a Tommy G, but more of like a, right. a Florida health version tennis player. And Tommy G's a, <laughs> yeah. a Chicago a rocker, you know, yeah, yeah. version. But I'm saying, but you had two guys like, so that becomes Siren on Mercury Polygram, Mercury Polygram Records. Tammy Show gets a deal on Chrysalis Records. Right. But they end up going, you know, they get. I think Kenny Hart played drums, okay. and not Mike Gorman, but whatever. So now you have two bands, one demo tape, the one that we recorded at DB Sound, one demo tape. They cut the songs in half. The ones that the one sister wrote, we took, and the ones that the other sisters wrote, they took. They took. Yeah. They became Tammy Show. We became Siren. Oh, okay. So that's how Siren came about. We had the um, All Is Forgiven, which was a song written, if you look on the credits, Cliff Johnson gets writing credit on that. Do you remember Cliff Johnson had a band after Off Broadway called USSA? Oh yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. And with a guitar player named Pete Kamita. 
Yeah. Okay, so it was so the writing credits on All Is Forgiven is Cliff Johnson, Pete Kamita, Robert Haas, Kristen Massey. Time to think when you're all alone. Time to think when your eyes are closed. Time is mine if I let it go. Forget the things that you want to prove. Forget the fact that you don't want to lose. Looking back, you will swim in shame. All is forgiven. All is forgiven. So there, that 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 band is so Chicago and got so much Chicago yeah. in it. So All Is Forgiven was the first single off that that uh, All Is Forgiven album, which you know did decent. We were on MTV tour. Yeah, we did. We did everything we were supposed to do. Tammy show ended up. I don't know. Didn't do all that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I guess at this point we could maybe battle it out on see who's yeah. got more YouTube hits or something. <laughs> but I'm just saying that one demo tape. Yeah. After Teenage Radiation, you know, we toured the. Album came out in '89, toured, and then as with everything else, it goes. And we had a song on the "My Stepmother's an Alien" soundtrack. One good lover, it was called. And well, we were, oh. I was going to ask you about that. And, yeah, and, about, and you had a little bit of a film career too. At the time, oh, didn't you? yeah. The the movies came up. I got into the movies during my Steve Dahl time, okay. like '84, '85. <clears throat> I was in Lucas, and like when they were filming movies here in Chicago. Yeah. Right. Like we, crazy. Like crazy. Yeah. We had those goofy Steve Dahl television shows. Do you remember the morning show? Sure. Or do you remember oh, yeah. he had like, he had the... Didn't you do, where'd you do that at? In Joliet, in Joliet at right? someone's house. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> but then we also had one like a cable show, whatever. I was on TV and the casting agents here in Chicago, you know, I was... You were like older, but you played young. Well, yeah. that worked out for me. I was yeah, already yeah. like, what, 55 years old. I looked like I was 12. So <laughs> this is excellent. Potter doesn't have any tits. Because I was in, like, when I was in Lucas, it was me, um, Corey Heim, God rest his yeah. soul, some kid named Charlie Sheen, yeah. um, Jeremy Piven, Winona Ryder. Wow. I'm the only idiot that said, no, no, I'm going to be a drummer. I should have stayed in the friggin'. Did, did they make it big? I don't know. One's already dead from heroin. I mean, Charlie Sheen's still alive, but poor Corey Himes yeah. already dead. Well, we know Charlie Sheen's past, yeah. But I'm, when I knew Charlie Sheen, no. The, yeah. Charlie Sheen didn't even have a car. When, really? when he was doing Lucas, I at that time I had the car because I was already <laughs> you playing. He, actually, Charlie Sheen came to see us with Steve Dahl and Teenage Radiation. We were playing on Archer Avenue. The place looked like a castle. Do you remember concerts at the joint? It looked like a oh, castle yeah. on Archer, like in, in like Willow in Lamont Springs. or Willow, Willow Springs. Springs. Willow Sp- Not the Willow Park Ballroom, but it was it was uh, it looked yeah, like a yeah. castle. There wasn't yeah. We were doing Lucas, I, and Charlie Sheen, and you know his. Yeah. They came out and hung out with us. Uh, so I'm saying, yeah, Charlie Sheen was a, yeah. just an up. He had not done. He got big after the, the Vietnam uh, movie. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. you know what I'm talking about. You That's smell that. <laughs> Is that the one? Apocalypse. That no, wasn't Apocalypse uh, Now. No, um, uh, but I'm saying he yeah, became yeah. a quote unquote movie yeah, star like yeah. after that. So it went from Potter, could I borrow your car to actually the yeah. guy that used to take the guy from yeah. the groove, Phil Dorner, who took care of my drums, started hanging like he called me from one time he called me from Malibu. He's like, yeah, I'm, out, I'm at Charlie Sheen's house. So if you call me back, you got to use a password to get because like, oh, really? like those movie stars back yeah. then, wow. you would have like you'd call didn't have cell phones back yeah. then, but you would call you'd call them and they just picked the phone up. And if you didn't say the password, they didn't talk to you. <laughs> so you'd have to call. So you call my, I call my buddy at Charlie Sheen's house in Malibu. Yeah. You'd have to go like, yeah. pumpkin. <laughs> yeah. And then when they heard the password, yeah. hey, what's going on? Yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> That's funny. I mean, nowadays you got this thing called, I guess, what? Yeah. Caller ID or, or whatever. But back in like the day. But yeah, so then he took my, so my, the guy that hung out with me and <laughs> took traveled with me did the drums set up the drums he was like hanging out with Charlie Sheen he called me from Charlie Sheen was a big um, basketball fan so he called me like from the Lakers plane Lakers game they were no, yeah well the, no they would fly they would fly from the they were going to the Lakers were playing Philadelphia so he's like damn I'm on the plane but this was back <laughs> nowadays yeah. I call my mom from yeah. 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 London I mean I'm talking back in 80 Oh, oh, yeah. five or six to be like on the plane or giving passwords on the phone you're like 
really? Yeah. That, that's pretty cool, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so that, um, so yeah, I did movies for a couple of years, but then actually my last film was, was to be Uncle Buck. And Uncle Buck, I got that role right when the Siren album was being released. And I had a problem right. with, I was forced to, basically, the album was being released would be February of 80, um, 89, and they were filming Lucas. I mean, filming um, Uncle, Buck. Uncle, Buck. Uncle Buck here in Chicago. I would have played the um, Jay Underwood. I would have been um, John, Can uh, John Candy's niece's boyfriend. Oh, okay. And I actually, you know, still live with my parents. So I'm hanging out. I get a phone call. It's Dick Asher, the president of, of Polygram Records. Hey. We heard you're doing a movie. I think he's calling me to congratulate me. Because <laughs> nowadays it's like, God, I'm a, yeah, yeah, I'm a heroin yeah. addict. I do yeah, movies. Yeah, I'm yeah. also a yoga instructor. And yeah. I've got 14 billion views on YouTube. Yeah. My God, she's, he's the star. Yeah. I think I'm getting a, con a congratulatory call. He's like, is there going to be a problem with you being in L.A. for this video on January 13th? I said, because I had talked yeah. to the band and talked to... That's right. what you also find out who your friends are too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. When when something good's happening for you, you find out exactly yeah. who cares about you. Right. Now your friends in the band, not Skender. Skender was already gone. Yeah, yeah Skender yeah. bowed out of Siren, and we got John Brandt, the bass player from Cheap Trick. Oh yeah. So si oh, so yeah, when right. you see the album, John Brandt, bass player from Cheap Tricks, in the band, Skender had already passed. Like. Yeah. It's a different scene when you go from, yeah, oh yeah, from the high school to Steve yeah, Dahl to yeah, now Steve yeah, Dahl into yeah. a band that's on a major. You, yeah, you, major you labels, sure. things, things change. So I'm just saying, Skender. I mean, he's always he's still my friend today. I mean, yeah. but I'm just saying, we got John Brand from Cheap Trick, and that's a whole scene. But um, so Dick Asher is like, you're not, gonna, there's not gonna be a problem, is there, Potter? I mean, I mean, yeah. I, I, you know. I think he referred to me as pretty boy or something. I mean, he was like, yeah. I noticed the tone of this conversation wasn't you excellent. Was we now had the way you thought it was going to go. No, I thought it was going to be my yeah. God, we're, we're putting out this new band and drummer's going to be in a movie yeah. Yeah. because this band isn't all about you. Um, and like I said, I'm 20. Yeah, I'm a yeah. kid. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I still and I'm young in the business, <laughs> you know, so I mean, I didn't realize. So basically he said either you come and do the you, you come be in the video because I think one of the quotes was I got guys living in cars that want to be in your position right now. Wow. Again, yeah. things that yeah. maybe if you're talking to John Bonham or even if yeah. Jason Bonham, whose yeah. dad was the drummer in Led Zeppelin, yeah. maybe he would go, Father, um, yeah. the record company, and John Bonham would go, well, I was in Led Zeppelin, I did. Yeah. I turned to my dad, who was a, yeah. a, a, working at car dealers, and he'd go like, whatever you want to do, man, you're going to be in a movie or be on MTV. Yeah. So, um, I then get a phone call from... Uh, uh, that's from the record side. Then you, yeah. you call your film agent. Yeah. Now they don't give. They don't care about you playing a set of drums. No. They they're yeah. they're getting money because you're going to be in a movie. Be in a movie. Yeah. So they don't really care about that career either. Yeah. So they're just like, what's so it? Imposing forces. For, yeah. Yeah, Coming but in. two two real. Coming we're not talking about. Well, am I going to real careers? Yeah. I'm talking career moves here. But I'm saying I'm a young yeah. guy in Chicago going yeah. like. So my film agent's like. Yes or no? And then I think I actually got a call from the producer of the film because John Hughes was directing. Yeah. It was a John Hughes movie, right. and John Hughes knew me from Steve Dahl. Right. If you remember, John Hughes was from the North Shore, right. was a Steve Dahl right. fan. I mean, he knew about Steve yeah, Dahl, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, and he did all those all those movies, filmed them all here. So he knew who I was, and he's like, Potter, I you know, I love you, but... Yeah, you know, I need an answer. I need, yeah, because yeah. I got it's costing again. People bring up how much everything's costing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is costing me. Yeah, how much a day? I mean, I can't because I was saying, could I go to LA, film the video, and come back? Yeah. Yeah. We were already, I already went to like they were filming the scene at the bowling alley in okay. Cicero. I'm saying they were already into production. Yeah, okay. whereas Siren filming a video would have come up in, yeah. And I said, is there a way I can... So you picked Siren. I picked Siren. Yeah. But uh, now looking back... Now looking back, um, Uncle Buck went on to become the highest grossing comedy of 1989. <laughs> yeah. It spawned a sitcom that I passed on. Yeah. That only lasted one season. Um... My film career pretty much evaporated after that. Yeah. The film people went, yeah, yeah. Uh, watch this Potter guy. Yeah, yeah. If his band, because I mean, I really was a drummer too. Let's not yeah. let's not hide the fact that in real life. But look at Kevin Bacon and look at uh, uh, well, well, I mean, there's so many, so many. 
artists or, or, or I should say actors think they they say they need a band. They have to have a band. Yes, and I'm, but I'm saying in real life when you do know me and you knew me when I was, a, yeah. I really did know how to play the drums. It wasn't a yeah. matter of like, yeah. oh, you know, because um. John Stamos plays the drums too. Yeah. God bless you, John. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just saying. Right. I think he was better on television. Right, right. I don't know if they would give him like a Buddy Rich gig. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. No. Well, your no, career no. is yeah. playing the drums. His right. career is acting. Yes. I mean, I'm just going to say that in a nice way. But I'm saying yes. I made the decision at that point to stick with this band. Who, like I said, was on Mercury Polygram. We had a you know big manager, big record company. And from all that was, I was being told uh, what was happening with the record, it was going good. Yeah. I mean, if, if we want to, you know, we, we were doing good. Like, I mean, back yeah. in those days, you had a, you know, the machine was working for you. Yeah. We were getting, we were getting added to radio stations. This was back when there was this thing called radio. Yeah. We were already getting added before the record. Cause so, so the record people are telling me, yeah. <laughs> Potter, yeah. in six months, right. you we'll, we'll do a movie on you. Yeah. Or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, don't worry about that. Movie people are like, hey, I don't care what you're doing with those drums. Yeah. It's costing me money. And yeah. by the way, I'm John Hughes. Yeah. So me and uh, Molly Ringwald said, yeah. either join us or move on because we're moving on. They moved on. I went to the, I went to Siren and we lasted, we lasted the year. I mean, we had a couple of, we had an interesting thing happen that, um, name of the band was Siren. Soon as you get on MTV and you start selling records and you become popular, other people come around and say, well, I'm in a band called Siren. We got sued by three bands. Oh, yeah. Three people <laughs> came to us. Now, back in the 80s, I guess I don't really understand. I'm not a lawyer. But from what I understood, back in the 80s, because the, the best way they could help, not everyone in those days had millions of dollars or something or thousands of dollars to have lawyers. If you could prove that you had the name prior. Yeah. Because that's what, like, there was a woman in Fort Lauderdale or something who called herself Siren and was able to show that she performed as Siren in 1977 or something. Yeah. So pay the woman to yeah. keep. And I would think, too, wouldn't a big record company that, like, when you went into their office in New York, like, we were in New York, when you went into the office, there was, like, a big mural on the wall, and there was Bon Jovi, John Cougar, the Scorpions, Potter, yeah. Um, yeah. Cinderella. Yeah. Like, oh, don't you think they had some legal people that would find out oh, which yeah. name has not been taken? Right. Whatever. Banned in Europe, banned in Canada, Canada and some woman in Florida, whatever, we got sued three ways. Record company goes, well, we'll give you blank amount of money. You split it up however you want. Give the, you know, but pay these people off. Oh, okay. Or change your name. Mm. Well, as it, yeah. Yeah, as it worked out, yeah, yeah, cause there's another story like that I've heard of the band Skid Row. You think there was any bands in that era named Skid Row? Whatever. Their record company paid and paid and paid. And they kept the name Skid Row. How about Cinderella? Doesn't Disney own that? Like I said, like I said, from now with legalese or or what I saw happen in the OJ trial, I'm sure you can find something somewhere to make something work. I'm just saying how it worked out for me was that basically in the middle... The album came out as Siren, All is Forgiven, by our second single when we were on um, the soundtrack of My Stepmother's an Alien with Kim Bassinger and uh, Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd, okay. Our name had changed to Red Siren. I could explain it to you, and you go, I understand that. Well, that's the same album. Well, the public didn't take to it. Uh, sure. We'd actually go to radio stations. Yeah, we just had Siren here last week. Yeah. That was us, man. Yeah. We're not Red Siren. Well, what's that all about? We didn't have the internet where you'd go like, my God, we're changing our name. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> I mean, nowadays, uh, my, we're changing our gender. Yeah. yeah and it yeah, works. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, we accept it now. Yeah. I don't know how I was able to equate changing the name of well, Siren no, to changing no, genders. I, I get it. I but get I'm it. saying you can get it out right. to the public. We had like, what did right. we have? There was a maybe a small blip in the in the trade papers, yeah, you know, yeah. like like R and R was that so radio. Down down in the, in the yeah, or, I think maybe page or something. Right, or Billboard magazine had a yeah. had a, a, a little piece. Siren. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's now Red Siren. Thank now Red Siren. Siren. Well, Thank you very that much. Yeah. stuff stopped for us. Yeah, I mean, just like the the radio ads. The song was the second song was decent whatever but you know what I mean it'd yeah. be like I don't know 
in the middle of the World Series, the you go from being this team to yeah. you're the same team, but we've changed your name and yeah. uniforms. People yeah. are like, wait a second, I was just watching the Yankees. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now you're called the whatever. Okay. So that band just so was that, that was maybe ninety, ninety one or something. When eighty nine, ninety. Now what you do then until you, or, or when did you start the Buddy Rich thing? Oh, the Buddy Rich thing happened way after. I, I had to live through the nineties and what yeah. would have been the grunge era. Okay. And I don't know if you could tell by my hair and dental work. <laughs> <laughs> I was way that 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 was a whole era that that was pretty tough on me. I mean, I played and I played in bands that were um, you locally know, here. Yeah, the band called Green. Okay, uh, Jeff Lesher, Clay Thomasek, like um, alternative type. Okay. You know, through the nineties. That right. um, then I was in a band called. Um, Super Mercado with Matt Mercado. He was the uh, had a deal on Mercury Polygram with a band called Mind Bomb. Okay. So I'm saying I played heavy. You know, I played yeah. like heavy. Yeah. Through the '90s. So that was a uh, Greg Potter. The early years. The early years. Well, here's our little surprise, everybody. We're giving you two parts of Greg Potter. That's right. You just listen to part one. You got to come back next week to listen to part two, the Buddy Rich years. That's right. Uh, we talked to uh, we talked to Greg for over an hour and a half, probably close to two hours. So we decided to uh, to put it in two parts. And you'll be able to get that second part next Tuesday. Don't forget to download it using your favorite app. Go to our website. Go to our Facebook page. And remember to listen to us on the Road to Rock Radio every Monday at 6 o'clock. They're featuring one of our podcasts, so make sure you tune in on Monday night to hear our podcast. And tune in all the time for some great Illinois rock and roll music. Rock and roll, blues, uh, any kind of Illinois music, you'll find it on RoadToRockRadio.net. I guess I'll have to do uh, two, two parts in this as well, won't they? We Two might. Mondays. We might. We just might. I <laughs> mean, I'm, rock radio. After talking with Greg, I I just can't stop chatting. I'm just I, I just want to keep talking. You're oh, gonna, okay. You're... Well, let's let's just relax now. Okay. Just relax now, right. and uh, we'll see you next time uh, next week for part two. Next week. Take it easy, everybody. Chicago, rock and roll.